Hello, everyone. This is episode 52 of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volp, founder of NimbleThis and the Volp Firm. We got a special episode today. With us live is John Downey in the flesh and also Mia Colibreeze. So let's get right to it and introduce them. So here we go. John on the far right. I'm via satellite. <laughs> <laughs> so, so hopefully we're going to have it's some a hologram. Good audio and video with you, John and Mia. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. So we're just back from um, Cable Tech Expo last week, and we're going to talk about some technology trends that we've seen in the industry and also share some things that we saw at Expo. Um, so I guess I would just start off first. You know, what, um, guys, what did you see at the Expo? And see anything that you found that's interesting? Ladies first. Um, well, why Brady? don't we just go through the... <laughs> Ladies first, Brady. Why don't we go through the slides? <laughs> All right, so... I think that would be actually more appropriate. Okay, so we'll pull up um, the slides that we have here and uh, load these up. Did you load those up earlier, right at during the show? Because someone brought it up to me. I did bring, When I was at the show, and they did, showed it to me. I did bring load some slides up during the show. That is true, yes. Okay. So, so um, if you're listening to the audio or, only, we're kind of um, going to dissect these slides as we go through. Or, if you're watching um, it on YouTube, you can Facebook. Yeah, catch the slides. So some of these, Mia, you said you've already yep. put on Facebook. Right. So on this one, it is basically Brady, me, and John standing in front of the low latency X Hall over Doxis display at John's booth. So John, I mean, why don't you tell us about it while you're at it? So I was kind of slated to man this part of the booth. And Cisco's booth had good traffic, but the theme of the whole show was 10G. 10 gigabit per second, how do we get there, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of different ways and <laughs> to get there. And ironically, one of those ways is extended spectrum docs is 1.8 gigahertz, which to me makes RF sexy again. <laughs> it does, right? Yeah. Like we're getting rid of RF, we're going IP, we're going digital fiber. But now we're talking uh, some more RF stuff and new test equipment. But let me, as I digress, mm -hmm. <laughs> the demo I was doing was low latency DOCSIS, low latency remote Fi, low latency X Hall, meaning that if I want to use DOCSIS as a backhaul for 5G, so excuse me, 5G mobile is fifth generation mobile, uh, it's touting some really high speeds. I mm -hmm. think you quoted some. I thought 100 megabits per second. I heard they demoed one gig to a 5G. Maybe it was really short distance and very limited, but um, I heard there's some really high speeds being touted with 5G. Yeah, which is I think it's up to a gig that you know you can do over 5G. So it's it's much more than 4G. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one more G more. <laughs> it's a it's, <laughs> it's a, a whole G. G. More. <laughs> <laughs> but so everyone that came up to me, I think they were more concerned about Doxis latency for gaming. You yeah, know, there was more talk about how do I get a gaming service? How do I increase revenues or keep the gamers happy? So there are some things in the cable lab spec for uh, something called PGS, a new service flow, one millisecond maps to make it faster. Doxis 3.1 upstream to make you know the upstream faster. Uh, we have another feature, Cisco proprietary called DPS, Doxis Predictive Scheduler, and um, the that was the stuff to make gaming better, but What's on top of that is how do I make Doxis so fast or lower latency that 5G can survive? Yeah, and, and that's the low latency X Hall. Yes. So I think, you know, there's two, two things that we're talking about low latency Doxis, which to your point, people are, are, are looking at for the gaming, and low latency X Hall, which is, has nothing to do with the gaming side of Doxis, but is really focused on how do we transport 5G over the Doxis Correct. networks. I mean, if we're gonna take the time to do low latency, let's look at the big picture and what's gonna generate more revenue. And it's not just the gamers, mm -hmm. uh, it might be 5G. Whether you offer it, or you actually offer your network as a backhaul to uh, existing mobile operators. Yeah, I think both are really important. And you know, wh which one's more important probably depends on the operator and whether or not that operator has competition nearby, uh, say a fiber uh, te telecom yeah. operator that is uh, saying, hey, we offer really low latency. If you're a gamer, you may want to take our service. Uh, on the other hand, operators are looking at low latency X hall. Uh, they're ones that are wanting to offer telephony service and uh, like 5G telephony service. Yeah. So, I, I wouldn't even say telephony. 
I, I think we use that term yeah. for yeah. talking. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not talking at all. It's using <laughs> yeah. mobile it's, to access movies and yeah, yeah. everything, right? People you don't know, talk as much over cell. The other term I'm, I'm starting to use more because I, I, when I hear wireless and people need mobile, I'm starting to use the term mobile just to be yeah. succinct. Because wireless to me is Wi-Fi yeah. uh, in my mind sometimes, even though wireless, I think, really does mean mobile. Yep. But I, I'd like to now say HFC, you know, fiber, digital fiber, analog fiber, uh, mobile for any type of mobile device. Um, and then wireless to me might mean Wi-Fi or maybe I say Wi-Fi, right? All right. No, that's a good, good point. Yeah. So... So that's the introduction <laughs> to, our, to our pictures. Uh, uh, the next picture that, that uh, we have on here is uh, one of me. I guess it's the back of my head. Yeah, well, no, and there's, we're the, there's, uh, there's, it still shows the, we're still at the Cisco booth, and it shows the Cisco, um, no, no, uh, this, the node with the AOI integrate, is it AOI? Yeah. AOI inter integration in the flexible Mac 5. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. And so, and then we went over to the AOI uh, booth and we saw what they had and we also got a demo from the Entraway um, mm -hmm. giving us, and I'll let you talk about that, but if you want to still talk about what you were doing. Was it the, a a was it the ATX booth? No, 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 no. It, it, it actually AOI actually had a booth at the AOI. show. Because ATX is making the housing for the new GAP node. Okay. generic access platform so what you were showing there was the lid of the gap node okay and with the cpu capability in this gap node we can port some of our upstream scheduling mm -hmm. which okay. is this new lor which is low latency remote fi where we're like well you don't really need remote mac fi everywhere only under certain conditions and longer delays and where you need it you might say hey i could put the upstream scheduler in the node right so now the timing is really just between the RF, you know, the, the cable modem and the node itself. The SIN, the digital fiber, could be thousands of kilometers, but your scheduling is right there at the node. So it's almost like Mac Fi, but it's Mac Fi Lite, if right. you will. So that also helps with latency. But we and we had the lid of the gap node showing that, and the full node was in the ATX booth. Okay. Okay. All right. No, I don't have a picture of that, but I do have just the picture, and it's kind of cut off here because I didn't want to have yeah. a running. I took tons of pictures. I Who think was, there is a better so picture actually picture, on Instagram. Whose finger Instagram. in your ear? That <laughs> is finger? George Kinkovas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tequila George, we'll yeah, call him just to George. keep him innocent. But uh, so the AOI is making the RPD that's in the picture at your booth, correct? Yes. Yeah. We, then we went to the AOI booth, um, who makes the RPD. We talked yeah. to them. We also talked to Intraway, who is doing a uh, a, a joint uh, integration there where Intraway is doing basically the, the orchestration to help bring on uh, the RPDs for, for AOI. Um, so that's a, a nice solution that they were presenting between Intraway and AOI, a nice demo that they were showing where you could see the RPD coming online, the RPD going offline, and how they were doing that integration. So that, that is what we were doing at the, at the AOI, AOI booth. Yeah. yeah. And so, it's going to be a, with thousands and thousands of RPDs, almost like little CMTSs, yes. if you will, yeah. sorta, there's a lot more reliance on automation. Yes, yes, absolutely. How do I update? How do I upgrade? How do I load firmware if I need it? Um, how do I turn them on? How do I activate them? How do I control them? How do I redistribute capacity? Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of stuff that will need to be automated. Yeah, and that's and that's Tal's a, been on before to talk about yeah. this, right? And, and that's a big change from thinking about an analog fiber node versus a RPD. Yeah. Uh, you can't just go out and, you know, stick a, a remote FI with an RPD in it and power it up and think it's going to go. You have to have that orchestration piece behind there to say, hey, it's actually coming online and, and then monitor it and see what's going on. Yeah, and then the RPD might be fed from a cloud or virtual and not a, a, a hardware core anymore. Right, 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 right. So now you have a data farm somewhere feeding remote FI devices. Yep. So yep. Your CMTS comes into a 1RU server. You know, it looks like a 1RU server feeding this stuff. Um, so then, of course, a big part of the show is going to see some of the presentations and, and things like that are going on. Um, this one here is just kind of uh, uh, was was on low latency X Hall, yeah. and uh, uh, 
uh, so you know, some of our friends were giving presentations. We watched this one, and on the left, they're sort of talking about the tech behind it, and on the right uh, are the sort of the uh, the CCF was, curves yeah. that are showing how you know the improvement uh, once we activate low latency backhaul. That uh, you know the blue line saying this is without, it's not very tight. The red so line just, says, well, this is when we turn it on. Uh, low latency goes, you know, it's it's really sharp, t- tight. It's yeah. you know in the milliseconds. Yeah, I even had these in the slides in my demo. It came from Tong, who works in John Chapman's group, mm-hmm. and uh, the orange reddish line was um, something called bandwidth report. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was BWR. Yeah, it was synchronizing the mobile's request grant cycle talking to the CMTS to bypass the DOCSIS request grant cycle. Right. So, I mean, you got one technology on top of another technology. How do I eliminate the DOCSIS latency? Uh, yeah, so actually what was interesting to me in, in this one presentation, the, the slide on the left, they're talking about um, LTE systems, and they're actually quite similar to DOCSIS systems when you get into the request bandwidth and stuff. So the bandwidth report gives you the ability uh, to integrate DOCSIS and LTE systems, in particular 5G, so we can kind of predict that when when 5G traffic is going to be requested, that request grant cycle, we can communicate that to the DOCSIS network and say, well, we know these requests are coming. Let's predict in the future. Um, we, we can kind of give that padding in the prediction so that the DOCSIS network can allocate grants before uh, the, the wireless network is, is uh, allocating those grants so that the grants are ready from the DOCSIS network for the, the Wi-Fi network. And, and that's how they're really um, getting ahead of things and getting the latency down. Yeah, and the key there is, and you hit the nail on the head when you said it's, it's, it's giving grants. So you're actually bypassing the upstream request grant cycle of DOCSIS, meaning uh, I'm synchronized with the bandwidth report of the mobile. It has its own request grant cycle. The downstream maps of DOCSIS are giving out the grants, but the modem is not sending just empty requests. Right. Which was kind of key to me, because if the technology is saying, oh, bypass request grant cycle, but it's still happening and requests are happening. And they're tying up the network. Contention requests, yeah, yeah. So you're hoping that there are no requests, kind of like UGS, right? Yes, absolutely. So I think that was that was really interesting to see that uh, that presentation and some of the other ones that were associated with that. So things are things are definitely coming along in in as far as technology in in, in the industry. So then uh, our next slide we have here is myself uh, at the VX booth with again good friends, uh, our friend Cyril Cyril Morrell and uh, other folks there. Yeah. So. Uh, Again, a big part of the show is social socialization. Uh, NDF, NDR, is that what they were touting? Uh, Yeah, I mean they're just they're continuing to advance Wi-Fi box. Continuing to advance their equipment. Um, I think one of the neat neat pieces of test equipment they have is a a small block box uh, that you interface with a tablet specifically for speed testing. And uh, it, you know, works. Raspberry Pi or something? uh, I don't know. You know, they didn't really discuss what technology is in it, but you can test a gig, 2.5 gig. Uh, You can multiplex multiple multiple ports together to even test beyond 2.5 gig. So the nice benefit there is, um, you know, a a lot of handheld equipment now gives you the ability to test up close to two, up close to a gig because they have a gig port on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what their box does is give you the ability to test beyond that. So now we're, you know, we're getting into 10G. They'll be able to test 10G services. And that's something we've, we've, you know, not really had the ability to do with really low end test equipment. You have to have pretty high end test equipment to do that. They now have a solution to you do mean that. Like Rodeo Schwartz or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah really, really high end. Um, you know, get into like Ixia or Accentus or okay. really high end stuff. They now have a field solution, so that was pretty cool. So, so I'm trying to visualize. Does it? Tied through an existing cable modem, or it has its you would own... you could plug it into the cable modem. You uh-huh. could plug it into anything um, that you really want to do uh, more than one gigabit speed testing on. So, I mean, good use would be a, a, a cable modem or a business service that's getting more than gig speed, or at least even gig speed, yeah. and you just want to absolutely verify you have that gig speed or yeah. two point five gig speed, and do it with really high accuracy. Yeah. So then uh, every year, uh, this is Dr. Alberto Campos from Cable Labs. Um, uh, so he's, you know, one of the, he is pretty, you know, the, the pioneers of PNM. PNM. Yeah. So he we gave always. a really great demo too of PMA. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and um, uh, the big technology that he's working on now is coherent optics. 
And so coherent optics, if you've not been exper exposed to it, it it's, it's fiber optics on steroids. We are taking fiber optics. We're modulating it at, at, at the higher modulation orders. And um, the, one of the things we know with it is it, it, it's going to require some PNM, proactive network maintenance, for that because there's going to be complexities in the fiber optic network, such as reflections, attenuation, um, uh, the optics going in both directions because they, we can do that with coherent optics. Uh, some of the impairments that we're going to see will require proactive network maintenance in order to help maintain that and make sure it's going well. Coherent optics gives us the capability to transmit optics at very, very high uh, data rates. Um, so that is, that's one of the technologies that Alberto is focused on and cable operators are now looking at it and something that I think we'll be seeing because it's gone from just a concept to just a demo to now um, vendors actually having equipment. And that was the demo that uh, Dr. Campos gave us where they were doing interoperabilities with different vendor vendors that are able to do coherent optics um, now. So that, that's going to be coming to us very soon. Is it to save fiber, save wavelengths, or just higher speed? Yes, all of the above. You can, I mean, <laughs> the high speed is the, is the main focus of it. But we can get, um, we can also save a lot of fibers. So we can do very high speeds over even a single fiber and do that duplex. We can do it in both directions over a single fiber. So okay. there's, there's a lot of co applications for that. And uh, you have a matching jacket and shawl type of outfit? Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> you synchronized up with him? I uh, All right. yeah. tried. <laughs> I yeah. Got so if you listen to the podcast, you can't see the, the, yeah. the funniness of that. So you have to come back and watch the YouTube on that. Um, so now we're moving into the the next uh, next slide here, and this is from uh, this is from the Casa booth. Yes, correct, this is Mia? the Casa booth. You can, Mia. I think you know this slide better than I do. Um, well, this is the providing 10G EPON and remote That's um, right. OLT using VDPOE. Very nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're getting you're getting all the initialisms. Yes, <laughs> they're not over, acronyms. Over our, uh, Doxus network. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, so I think that's right. Casa did um, they, on our CATV <laughs> HFC plant. Yeah, Casa very graciously <laughs> gave us a really detailed um, tour of their booth yes. and and really w spent some time and and went over all the different technologies. And the first one um, was on the on the EPON side. Um, from there, they they took us in onto their uh, more of their fiber node. I'm sorry, not fiber node. Their uh, RFI and uh, uh, CMTS side or CCAP side with DOCSIS 3.1 and they are also focused on low latency of course that was <laughs> low latency across the show that's the next slide yeah so I'm sorry that's the next slide I'll get on to that um, so here's their uh, delivering low latency so they uh, of course are very focused on that and, and had a, a nice demo to give also on low latency uh, Mia anything else you can think to add from that? No. Do you remember anything on their DOCSIS 3.1 upstream? Did they um, I, I don't remember uh, them. Just how, this, how it works, or yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't recall anything we discussed on that. Yeah, I would say three one upstream is is just starting to get some mind share, I guess, because yeah. no one really has spectrum to use it. And uh, now that people are going to eighty five megahertz in some cases, there's some spectrum, and uh, I'm really advocating. You know, four eight TDMA below forty megahertz, and then use the rest above for mm -hmm. for OFDMA. But don't try to squeeze out OFDMA below 15 just because you think it'll work. Yeah, it's really so not worth it. We, you know, we have some customers that are operating up to 85 megahertz. John, I think we've talked about this before. E even those customers, the population of DOCSIS 3.1 modems is still so small um, that they're, they're still finding it's more effective to use four, you know, AT, or eight ATDMA channels up to 85 megahertz, even still uh, before turning. Uh, o o OFDMA on in the upstream. Still, they have the channels with uh, the challenges with homes that have uh, house amps in them. 42 megahertz filters. Yeah, in which case they're limited to 42 megahertz in those houses, but um, they're still overcoming those channels because you can still do four channel bonding in those houses, but you can't do eight channel bonding. Uh, there is now, I've heard, um, there are some companies that are making 85 megahertz house amplifiers, uh, but they are, they are <laughs> tough to get. Uh, so they're still in limited quantity. So I'll give you an example. What I think might work in this situation is knowing that the filter cuts off at 42 megahertz, and it's not a modem filter, it's a house filter. Mm -hmm. So you have no control over it. You don't know it's there. Yeah. Like, it's not in the cable modem, it. right? And um, 
if you put four 18 inch channels below 40 megahertz and the other four above about 50, assuming they still fit. So 50 to 85, 26, yeah, it should still fit. Mm -hmm. By doing that, any modem that has a filter in the house should not ever see or range on the frequencies above 50. Yeah, you know, my you, point you is you have you, to move that yes, one channel above 50. If you put 50. 150, one 18 MA right near that roll off, it can actually lock onto it. Yes. And you don't want it to. And that's what's happening in for <laughs> So you're better off just put a little gap there if mm -hmm. you can and just yeah. move it up a little bit higher. Yeah, absolutely. So all right, uh, we're so so we're still at the Casa booth in the in the pictures here. I, I think this is the last yes, one um, where they they were just talking about uh, the spectral efficiency that you get with using PMA. So PMA is profile uh, management management application. Yes, is PMA. that I think that's what PMA yeah. stands for. I, I'm it's, I'm working it's on with. The slide. It. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> if I could just read the slide. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd be so much better off yeah. if I just looked in front of me. So, um, so what they were doing is they were dem demonstrating uh, the Cable Labs PMA uh, functionality integrated with their CCAP. Um, so, uh, you know, PMA largely works on receive MER, and they were they were just really showing that demo and, and or th that application in action. Um, so it is a nice demo to see that. So they they would inject an impairment. They would show the modulation profiles drop down. Uh, in the CMTS, they would remove the parent and the, the modulation profiles in OFDM in the downstream would go back up. So it's just kind of nice to see that happen um, Did they say dynamically. How, how many profiles they were going to support or they really go into that? They didn't go into detail of how many profiles, but you could just see the, the profiles drop when there's an impairment there and profiles improve when the impairment yeah. goes away dynamically, which is, is which is what you want to see And happen. when it dropped... I know I'm going into detail, but when it dropped, did it drop the whole block? Like I, I didn't look at uh, two K. I you know, didn't do like a mixed profile. You don't I know. wasn't looking at the to see if the whole block was dropping. I was yeah. just looking where they put the impairment in. Yeah. But I don't I don't know if the whole block dropped or yeah. uh, just the area under the impairment. Okay. But again, it was. I mean, that's that's yeah. the idea. Is if you want to get more complexity, you would have an external device like this mm -hmm. that would do machine learning, artificial intelligence, SDN, right. that would get all that information and be able to build profiles. Mm -hmm. And then you would manage those profiles. Like our CMTS right now, Jason Miller and I, we're like, we have five profiles that the modems can, I say NVRAM, but the modems hold on to five profiles when they register. So we recommend five profiles, a 4K across the board, a 2K, a 1K, maybe a mixed, for roll-off areas that you know about, and your data profile, profile zero or profile A, which is always 256 qualm. Right. So modems always register on zero. Then once they report their MER, the CMTS makes a decision, say, oh, you're a candidate for 4K. Mm -hmm. And if a problem happens, it'll drop. But right now, it would drop the whole thing, 4K, the 2K, right. the 1K. And we're finding great success just with that without adding the complexity of an external application like PMA at this point personally I feel like this machine learning and artificial intelligence and PMA I think the power of it is when we get to Doxus 40 modems and we support uh, FDX higher uh, capabilities and I'm hoping 8k and 16k qualm yeah I really believe like people say oh, it's a pipe dream you'll never do it I have 4k qualm working today in the downstream in a lot of places Mm -hmm. And if I look at my MER and I know where the breakpoints are, I bet you I could get 8K to work in some cases. So, so I, I think, you know, if we just look at changing modulation profiles, that's, that's kind of like the basic uh, first level of what we can do if an impairment comes into the plant. But with PMA, there's, there's a lot more variables that we can change in OFDM, mm -hmm. like cyclic prefixes and stuff yeah. like that. And, and PMA gives us the ability to look at the impairment from the receive MER per subcarrier standpoint and then say, do we just want to change the profile or do we want to change other things in, in this, the CCAP device, in, in, that, uh, in the OFDM <laughs> architecture? And, and there's other variables that we can move in there that under an impairment scenario, we can overcome that without maybe dropping from 4K. Um, that can overcome that. That's so that's true. PMA gives us other bells and whistles and hooks in the C cap that we can go in and adjust and adjust that. So from a proactive network maintenance standpoint, 
when we have all those other variables, the knowledge of the plant impairments that we can take in and feed that in the PMA, we can make, you know, the first thing we do is make profiles. recommendations yeah. to the guy who's controlling and configuring the CMTS. But then the next step, and this is kind of what um, CASA was was providing is not only do you make recommendations, but you can make real time updates to yeah. it because the impairment may not always be LTE ingress or some type of no, you know, it, it, you never know what that impairment is going to be. And the impairment could be someone adding a qualm channels that weren't previous there right, right adjacent to, to the OFDM channel. And in that case, you don't need to drop the, the, uh, the, the profile from 4096 to 1024. You might want to change the cyclic prefix. Or, to the, say, ramp, or the, the ramp down time or the garbage. Exactly. And, and those are things that you, know, might, you want, might want to change permanently or you might want to change for a few days while someone's doing that test by putting those adjacent qualms on there. And that's kind of a complex decision to make that is built into that PMA algorithm. So that's why we like yeah, If he knows the MER is bad on the guard bands, it might not be an adjacent channel, but it might be a microflexion or something. Absolutely. Like. So Absolutely. then if you go from 192 cyclic or cyclic prefix, however you say it, yeah. um, <laughs> 192 can get me the most throughput because I'm doing less. But if I do see those problems, I might be able to increase my cyclic prefix, which adds overhead. But now my MER. But you're still running at forty. Board. I still yeah, rather add the, the overhead and run at forty ninety two rather than drop the ten twenty four because that's going to be a much bigger loss. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so, okay. So we'll go and then look at the next slide here. Um, this was actually uh, Spectrum Charter gave a really really cool demo which caught our eye because of the Legos because well we just like Legos mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> And then uh, the slide on the, and uh, I don't know, well, we, yeah. we should talk actually, I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about so the demo. So basically they just gave a little demo and this was supposed to be a fictional little city that just happened to look a lot like Denver. <laughs> it did. And, um, <laughs> and so the first demo, and a nice uh, guy from Charter, his name was Cliff, Cliff, gave us the demo. And then first they went over and they showed a demo about parking. So, you know, parking's always a pain. So they... They put in Denver this parking system that doesn't use sensors, it uses cameras. And so you can like go on an app and then you can see where a parking spot is and then you can drive to the parking spot. Instead of driving around looking for a parking spot, you can find it through this app and just go there. Instead of like driving around <laughs> using congestion, polluting and things like that, you can instantly I saw something portable there. like that in New Orleans. <clears throat> Did you see that? No. no. In some of the streets, they had like portable things they set up and it was tied to, I think, solar and Wi-Fi or yeah. something. And this was tied and to it was solar. A sensor on, and it was a sensor on there to tell you that there was a spot open. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see that. Well, this was with a, this, they used cameras here and then... Um, so that's why I don't know other, if it was a sensor or a camera. Well, it used the camera and then uh, the other thing that was pretty cool about it with the cameras is that if someone keys your car or steals your car yeah. or whatever, it's also a little bit of added Or security. even from a security standpoint, attacks you. Yeah. They, they have that on, on video then. So then the second one is the demo with Brady with the VR glasses on, and this was actually a hog farm. And you're like, huh, what does the hog farmer do with that? So basically the hog farmer uses it, instead of having to check his pigs and see if a pig is sick or a pig died or mm -hmm. something like that, he can just like, they che it checks the temperature of the pigs. It checks to see, you know, what's going on with the pigs. And then IOT you can just, the PIG. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but a pig is actually not a, anyway, and um, it's not an initialism or a, yeah. so anyway, um, but it, it was pretty cool, and the hog farmer said it actually Where's freed up a lot go? of his time. He just has sensors in the in the. They have like the CO two sensors, air yeah. sensors, and all the different cameras kinds of, and, and cameras. stuff like that. So like I made what I was able to see with the uh, uh, the, the, the VR the VR glasses is um, I could go from different areas of the farm just mm -hmm. by clicking on it. You can launch a drone to fly around the farm. Then you can go into the different buildings within the farm and check on the pigs check on the co2 levels the temperatures whether or not they've been fed yeah. so you, you can see that and and go into you know basically without leaving your your house check all, all over the places on on your farm and just get a status update which is you know I, I, if you're a farmer i think that and would it frees be a, up a your time, time to yeah. work on other things you don't have to smell it <laughs> well, I don't think farmers care, but the um, and then the third thing on the spectrum thing was that they showed um, sensors that they put on basically like a light pole, 
and it was for noise, it was for CO2, um, it was for, I forget some of the other ones already, but I was a little skeptical of this one because I was like, well, uh, what do you use it for? Seismic meters? And, um, Gunshots. It could be. Yeah, well, they well actually he was explaining like in Denver because like cities that have um, emission problems because of the mountains mm -hmm. that helps notify cities this is a red you know if you're if you have Apollo, asthma Apollo, don't Apollo go outside yeah. well yeah but in Atlanta we just can look out the window but <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding you know but in Atlanta it's basically all seasons are bad so for pollen but um. Anyway, it was pretty interesting, yeah. and um, they sell it to municipalities. They have something going on in Reno and in Denver, and I, one other city. And I apologize for not remembering right now, but it was it in was, Florida. And uh, yeah, it was in Florida, and um, it was pretty. It was pretty cool, actually. You know, and I'm. It was just another way that um, cable operators can actually generate revenue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I thought that was pretty interesting for them. So you know, I uh, through the Internet of Things. Yeah, no kidding. So. The parking idea, I would print out a miniature looking car and paste it on the camera <laughs> and it would save my spot every day because no one would park in it because they would see this little, yeah. little tiny car. Maybe. <laughs> uh, John. You got to think like a, I don't know. So Nokia had a booth, uh, you know, no surprise. Low latency they're talking about um, with their uh, gain, you know, gain speed there also. Uh, they also had an AOI RFI node in their booth. So... Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to talk to uh, Bill Haversham, our yeah. old friend who yeah. is now working there. We did uh, try to look him up, but just never got a chance to We to did sync talk up to Court, him. and we did talk to a couple others, though. Yeah. They gave us a tour, and that was it was interesting to see what they had going on. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see where Nokia goes in the market. Yeah. Um, and then uh, stopped and visited our friends at Effigis. Uh, again, they're doing showing yeah. leakage and uh, pressure, pressure test, test kits. Uh, our, our thing is we really like the pressure test kits from a P&M stand, yeah. standpoint. Because if you identify a house that's leaking noise or uh, is having some type of impairment, uh, identifying the in-home wiring problems. Why do they call it a pressure test kit? So, well, you can use... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so, so you take... Uh, basically, you disconnect the drop to the house, mm -hmm. and you connect it to uh, one of these signal generators. It generates uh, a couple of RF tones mm -hmm. at uh, 60 dBmV, so it's a fairly high power level. Yep. And then you use a, a, a signal like a handheld signal le leakage meter to go around, and any, any poorly connected RF connector, any damage to coax in or around the house is going to emit that signal that you're basically generating and injecting into the house yeah. and pressurizing the house with RF signals. All right. And, and it's, so, a, it's a play on the word yeah, pressure. Absolutely. Yeah. You're loading it with RF. Yep. And yep. You're looking for and any, right. any leak you find is going to be a bad connector, uh, you know, bad RF coax. RF loader doesn't sound as good. And, and, and any of those bad, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> RF loader, what's that mean? <laughs> so so if that's what you're looking for. Is those, those bad connectors, that bad RF, those are all creating micro -reflection. What about these? frequencies you set it at can you set it is it variable? It's, it's normally fixed I, I it might be variable i'm not sure i haven't played yeah. <laughs> i haven't really tried to move yeah, them but there yeah. there's a, a low frequency and a high frequency sometimes they're like tri-band where you give you a mid frequency yeah. but the low frequency um is is important because that finds like really bad gaps the the high frequency finds smaller leaks you know smaller yeah. connections where the rf will leak out yeah because i mean we've always said that Holes in cable and problems with cable can be very frequency selective. Yes, absolutely. So you could inject a 27 megahertz CB type of signal, and maybe it doesn't emit at all. Right. But maybe it does emit at 700 megahertz. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it'd be nice to know, like, do I have flexibility or um, am I missing some things? Like, if we start talking about 1.8 gigahertz, maybe I need this to quantify or qualify out yeah. to 1.8 gigahertz yeah that'll be an interesting thing when we get yeah. into and we talk about an extended spectrum possibly or yeah. if we have time today but um <laughs> when, when we get into those higher frequencies i would agree with you i think uh we need a higher frency in a pressure test kit yeah because you get into those really really i said rf sexy again yeah yeah RF is sexy again we did do Brady did do a nice demo with um, the pressure test. Yeah, there's a there's a YouTube video of me yeah. using it if you want to see more. Uh, the divisor booth, which is the the next uh, image that I have up on here, had a really cool demo, really 
really neat thing that they're doing. So on the slide on the left, they have a, a uh, really high sample weight rate uh, spectrum analyzer. Yeah. They do 10, 100,000 samples, I think, and they they go up to, do you remember how many gigahertz this goes up to? Is it is 10 gigahertz, I think? I thought it was... Um... So it goes, anyhow, yeah. it goes up to really high frequency, but what they're, what they're focused on is cellular. And um, so the antenna there mounts to a drone, and it's, it's a pretty large drone. They fly it around cell towers, and what they're looking at is both the radiation pattern of the cell tower, but more importantly, the interference that would come from other buildings or other places of emission. Once they find that, they can use the drone to directly target maybe uh, a, a, a apartment building or a business take that has a well they could take it out <laughs> yeah. put a hellfire missile a tactical on it missile. Um, no. but they can they can directly triangulate on someone else who could be have an antenna on their building that's uh, interfering with that cell tower mm -hmm. and you know from there they could you know, work with that person or call the FCC or you yeah. know do whatever is necessary well, I think to, they, he said they were primarily using them in Europe right now yes. So I think the rules in Europe are a little different, but yeah, it was pretty impressive watching the demo, yeah. which I don't have any live so was action it, it was of a it. Video but of the, of the yeah, and it was actually yeah. taking off. And what they do is they they the you have to get a flight plan, you have to get it yeah. approved, and um, a pilot actually has to fly the yeah. the drone. It was pretty. Fifteen year old kid is a pilot. No, no, no. <laughs> Apparently, the the way they do this now is they use a crane. And, and they have to go around oh, like a tower really? with a crane. So yeah. this this is an extraordinarily cost-effective way cost to, effective to, to uh, do it speeds now. Speeds everything up. So it's like yeah. the old flyovers for leakage testing for uh, for cable, but it's they have to do their own testing for mobile Correct. And, yeah. and towers. That's and pretty interesting. Yeah. So, that, so the picture on the right is a game of Pong or what? Uh, I, I think that was the radiation <laughs> pattern that they were showing. Oh, no, oh. no, no. Actually, what it is, is that that's the drone, and then that's the cell tower. Oh, yeah. Ah. Okay. Yep. You guys need glasses. Yeah, we definitely do. <laughs> um, so then on to power supplies, we went over to Alpha. Uh, they are now putting a DOCSIS 3.1 modem in their power supplies. And I mean, you, uh, you may ask why. I have good reasons, <laughs> good answers. Uh, we also see on the right-hand side that now they're putting SFPs in their power supplies. So, I mean, this is getting on to why we need DOCSIS 3.1 modems. Power supplies make great things for like backhaul because you have a DOCSIS 3.1 modem connected to the network. Um, so you can do backhaul on them. Uh, if we think about 3.1 modems as P&M test points, these are great places because they're, they're not in an, in, they're, they're somewhere in the, you know, it's distributed throughout the plant. They don't have all the in-home wirings uh, that, that you would add impairments to. So from a 3.1 perspective, we have full band capture, we have return capture. Uh, we can basically do sweep with them, in, um, both return and forward. So there's a, a phenomenal monitoring point at every it's a, it's a good logical power first log It's a good logical first visibility point. Absolutely. Because it's usually at the node or somewhere yep. close. At the node, could be out at other amplifiers in a plant if you're not doing RFI, you know, node plus zero, which a lot of operators are not going to go to node plus zero for... So, so get back years. to why I really need a 3.1 modem. Why wouldn't I use a 3, 32 by 8 3.0 modem? It's probably cheaper right now. And I, still get full bandwidth capture. You you absolutely could. This is just, you know, the next the next uh, step up, uh, yeah. particularly if your network is DOCSIS 3.1 and you want to do a lot higher speeds of, of uh, uh, mobile backhaul. That's that's the key there. Maybe you you need low latency. Yep. Maybe that's the logical latency. place for a, 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 a small cell. Absolutely. So really good solution. They're also doing a lot of other cool things. They're they had a wall basically that showed the Internet of Things. Yep. So they're they're so. doing Internet of Things associated with their um, uh, their their backhaul. They're also doing uh, Wi-Fi uh, access points on their power uh, on top of their power supplies. They're they're uh, doing these in like KOI campgrounds, so yeah. they can KOA KOA campgrounds, yeah. so they can do um, you know pretty much provide Wi-Fi yeah. to the campgrounds. They're putting cameras on so, these. So you can really rough it and get online yeah, and watch absolutely. ESPN live. Well, you gotta, gotta have your kids do, get, getting online. Um, so I, I mean, this is you know you're saying like Wi-Fi is getting sexy again. Power supplies are getting sexy. It's it's just amazing what they're doing with this this type of technology. Is there any talk about power supplies? Any changes in 
voltage or anything? I guess you really can't. Right? I haven't heard that. I mean, that, the reason that all power supplies, is, as I'm sure you know, are not, well, they grade them at 90, 90 volts, but it's 87 and a half volts, is if you go above 87 and a half volts, you have to have an electrician's license to work on them. So we, we keep our power supplies under 90 volts in the industry, so you don't have to be an electrician uh, to go out and, and actually do anything in an amplifier or anywhere in a line. And, and so that's, you know, if we go higher than that, we would have to have a lot of un- licensed electricians, electricians as technicians. Yeah. But I mean, the power supplies are basically, what, 15, 20 amp power supplies? Yeah, I, I think they're still all 15 amp. Yeah. I don't know if we have 20 amp out there. Uh, I think they're still 15. So, um, yeah, these are just some more of their, their cameras. Um, they've won. And, they're, and the housings are not clear they're just showing it. yeah it's okay. clear for demos but these uh so apparently a lot of these are distributed throughout atlanta downtown atlanta has a lot of them uh, tied into directly into the police department for monitoring crime and stuff like that it'd uh, also be good for um you know a lot of people get ripped off of craigslist and let it go and stuff like that <laughs> yeah and now saying if you do a craigslist uh transaction do it at a local police station or something yeah, like public that. place but maybe they have something like this set up and you know, a trade trading post. We, yep. We're going back to trading posts and stuff. Yeah. But it's monitored, and you can do a Craigslist trade. Yeah. But you know it's monitored. Stay safe. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then finally, another picture at the Alpha Boats. We talk about the IoT. They're doing a lot with IoT to get that, uh, you know, be able to, be able to monitor um, anywhere there's a power supply. You can have, you know, carbon dioxide sensors, security sensors, a lot of things like that. But also just with. mouse traps, yeah. and rat traps. And it was actually kind of interesting because he yeah. was like, you know, how much time do you spend like going to check a rat trap? Like, <laughs> so now they can just check full or empty. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it just has a little sensor on it. Yeah. yeah. Time it's building. We're just building smarter mouse traps. Yeah. <laughs> so and he showed a bunch of different yeah. stuff. This was pretty cool. So uh, this was this was my show favorite. And, and this is uh, a FDX amplifier made by Technetics. But what I, what I liked about it, it was, it was it's simple. And this just goes back to keeping it simple. Yep. Um, it's low gain, fixed frequency. So not, not doing echo cancellation, but uh, just giving you the ability to have a high split, you know, in, in a 600, I forget, it's somewhere in a 600 megahertz band. But, you know, kind of what we've talked about in the past, John, is not, uh, not, not having a... a Basically, basically keeping that fixed filter somewhere high up in the frequency, and uh, having an amplifier that supports full duplex. So they've done that. They have it really simple. It's a nice design, and I um, I got to see some insides of it. So I don't want to say more than that. But is uh, it really FDX where you do full duplex upstream and downstream at the same frequency, or is it really like a, a diplex filter that's moved up higher? It's a yeah. It's a, so they don't have a diplex filter in it. They have a they do have a some kind of echo cancellation. To, it's not echo cancellation. They yeah. just have some ne- in, very interesting technology in this FDX amp. I they brought back gonna... feed forward technology, like back no, in the day. Not gonna <laughs> say. It, they, they, it was really. It was. Really Really? They didn't take the Wayback Machine. Yeah. <laughs> 550 amplifiers from Secor? Yeah, no, no, no. They, they did not do that, but I think they're going to do really well with this Like product. when Brady and I used to work there. But it, yeah. will it, allow, it won't allow the overlap, so it's not really FDX, right? But it's a... It allow both directions, but it's a it's it's a fixed frequency. Yeah. You can think of it as a fixed frequency diaplex yeah. filter yeah. without the diaplex filter. Yeah. So very cool product. I think they're going to do well with them. We'll see more of it. Um, but they're also really supporting the extended spectrum as well. So yeah. it goes up to right now 1.2 gig. I mean, that's the whole reason why we're even looking at extended spectrum is to open up the upstream. Yep. Absolutely. Everyone's talking about the downstream, but really the reason is to open up the upstream. Yep. And that's what we need. So uh, uh, we this is a, a good friend of ours, Julio. He's uh, he's been a follower of the podcast since day, day one. Day one. And he says he's he listens. He waits every month to see it uh, get a you know a new episode. So come shout in. out so to Julio. Shout out to Julio. Yeah. He was at, we know you're listening to this episode. He was at my booth too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. And he's a big fan of PNM. So Absolutely. thank you. Absolutely. And then um, this was at the uh, harmonic harmonics booth. booth. So. And. We went to see us off, and he gave us a tour. And um, his, uh, I forget his name, unfortunately, also gave us a tour of uh, Boris. Yeah, Boris gave not us a just, tour. Not and just Boris it was someone else too. But Nimrod. No, they all gave us. We we had yeah, they were all there. They're always gracious and and give us detailed tours of their stuff and a soft showing us all the dashboards that they have monitoring their applications. Right. So, their virtual uh, ID kit. Yep, absolutely. So that was. Um, 
that was pretty much our overall of the uh, of the show. Yeah. Did you have anything else from the Cisco booth that? So one of the big things was the uh, LOR, which is the low latency remote fi, which mm -hmm. will be part of the remote fi 2.0 spec, where we poured over some of the Mac like I talked about, the upstream scheduling. Mm -hmm. I see this advantageous for about three or four reasons. One, if you have long SIN, long fiber, uh, in a DAA, you know, distributed access architecture, maybe you consolidated a hub site and you moved the core farther away, and it's more than, say, I'm going to say 60 miles, <laughs> more than 60 or 70 miles. It's really not distance because it's delay. When you have a digital link, it's usually not a direct point-to-point -point link. It might be a router, a switch, a router, a router, a router. It could be 12 hops. You don't know the delay in all those devices in between. You might not have control over them. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at the actual delay. It could be 40 miles, but the delay looks like more than 80 miles when you look at just time delay. So going to an upstream scheduler closer or in the node turns around, around my request grant cycle a lot faster. So lower latency. Uh, number two... Cisco existing RPDs have CPU in them that we could port that into existing RPDs. So I don't have to have more power draw or more cost. Whether or not it's a charge to do this, I have no idea yet, but I could do it with existing RPDs. So that's kind of a, a plus. The other plus is when you move the upstream scheduler into the node where the physical layer devices are, it's not as susceptible to PTP issues. Mm -hmm. You know what PTP is? Well, yeah, it's a timing protocol. Yes, yeah, the precision timing protocol. Mm -hmm. So when you have a timing, 1588 timing, that you have a master, you have a, uh, a boundary clock, and it has to be all these devices in between, it's third-party devices, and you're doing redundant fiber links, like a Metro Ethernet ring, like the A path goes 400 kilometers, the B path goes 1,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. That failover is going to change your timing. It's going to have to redo your map advance. But if I'm doing the scheduling in the, in the node, then I don't... It doesn't have to matter. Read. Yes, it doesn't matter. So I'm like, hmm, that alone could be the selling factor for me because you're simplifying it right. for that part of it. Let me tell One more thing that I think it's, it's really great is uh, overhead. If you own the SIN, you usually don't care about the overhead because you're not paying for it because you own it. But, but I care about knows. capacity planning. Yeah. Some people pay for that network. I know. Some people lease that line. Yep. So any overhead, you're paying for it even if there's no DOCSIS traffic. That overhead is map messages. So we do 500 maps a second. Each map typically could be 100 bytes, 8 bits per byte. We do maps for every upstream in a Mac domain. That could be 8 upstreams. Because you could do and, a 1 by 2 service group. And is that with low latency or without low latency? Low latency is a 1 millisecond yeah. map, so it's even more. And then you tie in Depi, Uepi, um, you do all the mathematics, and then we replicate for all the primary downstreams. Mm -hmm. So if you have 24 primary downstreams, that's multiplied by 24. And if that's feeding four RPDs, they're off of that one 10 gig SIN, they're all getting it. Right. So that's multiplied by four. I do all the math. That could I was going to say, what's that work out to? 700 megabits per second. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, you're going to have someone to pay for 700 megabits got a, per second you of got overhead a, traffic. Yes, you got a 10 gig pipe that you're divvying up for the RPDs, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot. I got to get <laughs> rid of a gig. gig. <laughs> Almost a I'm gig. Almost a gig. So, yeah, it's that right there could be another yeah. good selling point. I mean, I can cut that down by cutting my primaries down, cutting the number of upstreams. Uh, the low latency one millisecond map is only for three one upstream channel. So, there's a lot of things. I, I would have probably only do two RPDs off a 10 gig link, not four. So yeah. I can get it down to like 100 megabit. You could get it down to zero if you just turned the RPD off. That's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that'll or and that'll save the, power too. Or put the upstream scheduling in the RPD and I get rid of that overhead <laughs> also. So, oh, but well, there's always that way. <coughs> so yeah. I like this idea. I think it has a lot of a credence. You yeah. know, I think it has a lot. Credence is a good word? Yeah, it's a good yeah. band too. Yeah. CC. <laughs> <laughs> got the clear water that. revival. <laughs> <laughs> All right, click and clack. Yeah. Am I yeah, you're like just that? shaking the table. I'm nervous. Yeah. Yeah. You, make, you make me nervous back there behind me. <laughs> <laughs> no one can see this, but hey, if you tune into the video, you'll see. You understand why I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. This one back Keeping here. Keeping it straight. <laughs> okay. So, 
All right, well, let's finish this off with a, a question. So you, had, so you had all those pictures from the show floor, right? but we really didn't talk about the workshops or anything outside. Yeah. Yeah. Is anything... We... Well, you, you, you had a workshop. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, actually, moderated? Yeah, I moderated mm -hmm. uh, a workshop on 10G um, and two Aris guys, Comscope Aris guys, Tom Clunan and John Um, And it went really well. Um, and we talked, it was a, t a lot of content. And I tell people, you know, we can't sit up here and just read slides to you. You can read on your own. And, and you know this, Brady. You've done mm -hmm. workshops. We write a detailed paper to go yeah. with those slides. And I, I have to say... I, I, I always think that the paper is the value there. And it's a pain I'm, to do it, but it's it's it, well worth it in the end. And I, I, I really hope that um, for, for anyone who's listening, who attended Expo, please read the papers because that is, is really where the content is. If you, and if you didn't attend Expo, the papers, do you know the link, the, the website where the papers are? It's in like, it, is it open? Yeah, it's always open. It's nctatechnicalpapers.com or something like uh, that. I don't know. So I'll have to look up the link and put it in the show notes below. Okay. Um, but that is a really valuable resource. Uh, so the Expo papers did not used to be open. It was for only people who attended Expo. Um, but the, the papers are now open. Nice. And uh, I'll, I'll get that. I'll put it in, Very in, detailed. in the show link. Yeah, yeah the papers are phenomenal. Better than the presentations. Uh, unless I'm giving the presentation, then I have to say it's on, I'm on par with the presentation. I mean, to. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a pain to write the paper, but then once it's done, you have it forever. Yeah. And it has such great content, you can pass it around, yep. you know, with SETs, okay? <laughs> well, there's always, I think there's like a 90-day moratorium with yeah. SCTE that you can't distribute the paper until then. And I think yeah. it's after 90 days. That's when they go okay. online. Okay. Next year, SCT is in Denver. Denver, it's next year. Mid October, and then and then after that, I understand it's going to alternate between Denver and Atlanta, Denver and Atlanta. Really, I okay. think yeah. Someone yeah. else has said Philadelphia, so I'm not 100 percent sure. We'll find out. We'll find out. Yeah. Um, so you. So that was the my workshop was uh, the the 10G how to get there. Uh, some FDX. There was also there. the Cable Labs. Yeah, so the Cable Labs had a vendor workshop on Monday. It was under NDA, so we really can't get into any details. Detail. But I mean, a lot of focuses were on things like 10G um, and, and related yeah. technologies to that. So, but it was also worth going Absol to. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would recommend anyone yeah. get involved with cable apps. Yep. So we attended that. Um, were you? We can't answer any questions, John. Or else no. we'll have, no, to, kill we'll have you. to kill you. Yeah, I know. And you know we can bury you in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> And Brady likes to dig holes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but um, so do you, I think because we're running on, on a time limit here, do you have any, um, do you want to answer the, ask the question? So, so we did have, um, it's actually quite a, a long question. Long question out, from but, but Jesse. I, yeah. So I, I, we wanted to go through this. Um, because we, John, it's like kind of like stump the chump question. Nice. We get a lot of good, in, interesting questions. And, and it started on this. Jesse said, I've listened to your podcast regarding T3, T4 timeouts. He has one of his own modems. It's an ARS SP8200. Yeah. It's a Doxus 3.1 modem that he bought on his own. Um, he, he has been working back and forth with his cable operator. We'll leave them nameless. Um, where he was having issues with this modem kind of being intermittent. Um, but I will tell you, Jesse is really informed. This guy knows what he's doing. Um, so he's looked at the transmit power, the upstream transmit powers of his modem, which, by the way, apparently is off of a, a 90 BMV tap that he says the technician put in there as an attenuator. So his modem, his his old his modem that he bought, Doxus 3.1 modem, that Aris modem, uh, the upstream transmit levels uh, were 37.4, 35.9, 36.6, and 37.4. So there's they're doing four upstream channel bonding ATDMA. The tech came out, and his the initial problem is his uh, and his downstream levels were all good. He's gone through all that. Um, so, you know, he's verified all that. His service is supposed to be 100 megabit down and um, uh, 10 megabit up. So, it's 100 by 10. So, everything looked good other than the fact that his modem was intermittent going offline, online. He had unstable service. So, this tech came out and said the problem was with his modem. It didn't have the right, it didn't have enough upstream transmit power, apparently, according to this tech. Uh, to you know, so the tech said, "Well, replace his modem with a Hytron modem," and um, 
the problem he has with his Hytron modem is he's basically locked out of it and can't see any of the levels. And uh, Mia, did we get verification that his modem, his service has improved with the Hytron modem? He, he hasn't. He hasn't actually said it improved or hasn't improved, yeah. but. So I, I mean, my sense is it, 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 he's probably still having issues. That's why he wants into the modem. Well, he but well, he wants into the modem because he likes seeing the d data. Yeah, that so he the was doing basically like a one ninety two one sixty eight dot one hundred dot one. He also doesn't want to rent it. Of Correct. The modem. Correct. And and uh, you know, kind of my struggle with this is he knows his modem's transmitting at the right levels because he yeah. he's even saying he knows the the recommended minimum upstream power is forty five trans. 45 dBmV, his levels were a little low and a low side. Yeah, I mean, he was at 37. But he got a tech that's telling him, hey, go as high as 51. Yeah, my tech's telling me <laughs> I'm not transmitting high enough and or, you know, at the right levels. And um, and, and you know, just replacing his modem here. And, and now he has no visibility. I'm kind of getting the sense that they're, and I've, I've, I've seen cable operators are starting to do this. You got someone who actually knows what's going on, so they give them a modem that they can't see into it. They're starting to lock people out, and I, and I've heard this to become more of a trend. Did, but you said he put an an extra nine dB tap. No, I think he was already off of a a, a nine dB MV tap. They don't make a nine dB M, dB tap. It's not actually. I've not DB. seen not, that either. It's not dB MV. So Ron would have it, our heads an, if yeah, we say dB yeah, MV. Yeah, yeah, right. It's nine dB tap. It's an eight dB, a four, a yeah. eleven. They don't come in nines. I don't know. Uh, I, I was surprised by that too, but I, I'm assuming he's reading that off of there. Yeah. Um, so I don't know about that, but what I'm surprised I wonder if, about, I wonder if it's a DC nine. Would be. A I DC bet you nine. put a directional coupler nine, and it's off the nine dB tap. Yeah. And you know what? Because that affects upstream and downstream, he's probably screwed up his downstream. Mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with his I, upstream. I, I am wondering because I don't see. I bet him you. saying that the downstream levels here, but that that could be what the issue is yeah. now. The, down, the upstream levels are just fine. Yeah. He may have put the 9 dB in t tap if that was not in there before. The directional coupler, 9 dB hey, directional let me, coupler. Let me make it worse. Says now, well, now my upstream levels are right in a. <laughs> let me make this worse. To have upstream levels low, so I'm surmising here, mm -hmm. he's off a low value tap, an actual tap. Right. Like a four, four tap. A four tap. The tilt, a four, the tilt uh, is like this. Now, Jesse, this would be a four tap up on the line where your drop yeah. is coming down. His tilt is going to be negative at that point, mm -hmm. downstream. His DOCSIS carriers are probably at the higher frequency, so they're even lower. But on the upstream frequency, the modems don't see much loss, so they're only transmitting 30. Mm -hmm. Technician puts a DC-9 in to make it transmit higher, drops the downstream even more. It's already down like this, probably at minus 5. Now it's probably at minus 14. It's probably a downstream issue. Yeah. Um, I'm, I of course, we don't know. We're guessing. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm now, my, my other question yeah, is: there, is it uh, what was a Hytron modem? Was it a Doxus three one modem they replaced it with? Are they using Doxus three one, or was it just a an analog modem? I, I mean, uh, a uh, Doxus three zero Hytron. Modem. Well, I think he gave us the Hytron modem number right there. It's an E. Yeah, I don't. I, I can't tell from that. Not, but I, I suspect no, it's, it's he's it saying it is. The Doxus yeah, no, he's saying they replaced it with a Doxus. So if they replace yeah. a Doxus 31 modem with another Doxus 31 modem, I bet it's downstream levels. Yeah. But we won't know because we can't see into the 31 modem. So, so he was able to probably on his PC um, type in 192.168.100.1. Mm -hmm. That usually is a, a built in uh, URL. Debug screen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, some MSOs will shut it down so you can't get to it. Which is, some, I think, Some are by because... default, and it's like, uh, you, admin password? Yeah. Is the username and password? Yeah, but no, normally be... you can get to the, even without the password, you can get into that basic yeah. screen just to see levels and stuff, which, you know, I, I think we're getting a lot more technical users, yeah. subscribers, and the, en entering the industry. And or not the industry, but <laughs> <laughs> entering the market, and and I think you know being able to look in and see what's going on that can be helpful. We and, let, and let them do the due diligence. Right? CSRs can ask yeah. those questions and say, well, what's your what's your levels? Yeah. But unfortunately, that's that's not what's happened with Jesse. And Jesse, there's no way to get into that modem <laughs> once it's been locked down. Yeah. You know, unless you're gonna hack what? into it, you're locked. No, out. no, I think he does. That's not what he wants to do. Yeah. I think he just wants to understand what's going on. Yeah. yeah so I would, I would place my bets on the downstream yeah i think the upstream looks fine from what he's telling us yeah but i mean with everything he's saying by putting it and i think it is a dc9 you know because it does say usually tap leg 
Yeah. The down leg of a DC-9 is, some people call it the tap leg. Right. But I think one of the other things to bring up before we move on was that initially when we were talking, you were saying that um, early uh, DOCSIS 3.1 modems weren't performing because, and then um, Cable Labs came out with a spec. No, so, so I was a little, con uh, and until confused. I actually saw the, um, the, the f uh, model number of his modem, I was thinking of DOCSIS 3.0 modems. Okay. And, and so what happened was, um, Early DOCSIS 3.0 modems had a, a max transmit level of, with depending on what you're bonding, might be 54, 52, 51 dBmV. And so that would limit the maximum transmit level, depending on how many channels you were bonding in the upstream at the same time. And then there was a, 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 a John, the ECN, what was that called? Extended yeah, transmit? Extended power. Extended, extended power. power. Yeah. Uh, and what that gave was, um, so newer DOCSIS 3.0 modems, or if the modem had a firmware update, some modems can transmit at a higher power, up, up to as high as uh, like 60 dB MV. Yeah, but it basically it was about 3 dB more. 3 so dB more. And again, channel, it depends on how much, yeah. many channels you're we were bonding. doing 64 qualm, 4 channel bonding, the... the the default was 51 per channel. Yes. But the extended power put me at 54. Yeah. So my initial thought with, with um, uh, Jesse, before I saw his transmit levels and found out which modem, he had a 3.1 modem, not a 3.0 So you modem. were thinking he was a legacy modem and, yes. and the maxed out at 51. 3.1 modem inherently has more power than yes. a 3.0 modem, and maybe it took care of it. Yes. This is what That's I what thought was thinking. going on okay. there. But then I saw he already had a 3.1 modem yeah, yeah. was his original And his modem. levels looked fine anyway. Yes. <laughs> they were 37. Yes, yeah. yes. So as a, okay. you know, it's like an onion. As you get to know yeah. more and more about it, you realize, well, it doesn't look like an upstream issue. Yeah. It looks potentially like a down, as yeah. you're saying. Downstream and issue. if it was an upstream like one channel all four upstreams are doing station maintenance so one channel goes down it just does partial mode yes but if you really screw up that one primary downstream it'll go offline yes so for him to say it's flapping online offline that even leans towards the downstream downstream issue. downstream issue yeah. absolutely yeah. all right, all right. well Guys, it's been really nice having all three of you here. This is a John. long one. <laughs> this is the longest one we've done, right? Yeah. I think. We should, uh, we should do this more often. And, and uh, good news for everyone else out there who hasn't already heard, John's getting fiber at his <coughs> house. <coughs> it's not hooked up yet, but... It's just a fiber bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, uh, they, uh, the local co-op in the area ran fiber to my house. I mean, I, I pleaded my case for a long time. Uh, you said you know, there were angry listeners I, all over the I, world. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> you were sending me stuff saying, this guy just stopped me and said, oh, my God. His yeah, I was really sucks. having them. I, I was like, believe. dude, we cannot handle it anymore. I know. Uh, but I pleaded my case to the local co-op people, and they trenched some fiber in about 18 inches deep, ran it to my house, the side of the house. Haven't done anything in the house yet, but uh, hopefully it better be by the next Google Hangout. We'll yes. be good to go. We good to go. Yeah. Looking forward to it, yeah, John. So I. Make a lot of people happy out there. <laughs> All right. So John and Mia, thanks so much for your time today. It's a enjoyable episode. We we do our best to bring good content to our audiences. So if you like the YouTube, please click that subscribe button and the notification bell. Maybe you'll get an announcement when we go live. Um, so have fun everyone. Take care. Please bye -bye. feel free to share. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Share along.